Anime takes on big sci-fi ideas all the time, of course. And with the field being nearly synonymous with giant robot, it shouldn't be surprising that artificial life is one of its most popular subjects. From 8-man to Evangelion, though, there's surprising flexibility in the anime robot as a metaphor. Take a closer look at three of the field's most iconic franchises, and it's clear that interpretations of this sci-fi creature don't have to be assembly line standard. Ghost in the Shell has spawned a slew of spin-offs, shows, and games, but the manga's most memorable incarnation is surely Mamoru Oshii's 1995 feature film adaptation. Throughout this anime, the deadly major Motoko Kusanagi leads an intelligence unit against criminal cyborgs, hackers, and other high-tech threats. She operates in a full-body prosthesis, meaning her brain and spinal cord are the only fleshy parts left of her. Hence, the major's consciousness is the titular ghost in the shell of her synthetic frame. The title plays on the term ghost in the machine, which has long roots in the history of philosophy, threading through the works of big thinkers like Gilbert Ryle. The notion relates to dualism, which proposes that humans' physical action and mental activity occur on parallel planes and, as such, their true connection can only be speculated at. Ryle actually rejects this thesis in his book, The Concept of Mind, which coined the ghostly term, asserting that mind and body are inherently linked. The major exists to explore that assertion, pondering whether she's honestly the same person she was before getting implants. Does her identity change as her shell does? Or will something, call it a ghost, or mind, or soul, always endure inside? Upon its release in 1995, the movie wasn't just a sensation in the arena of anime, but a discussion piece for global film. Not only did it carry influence from Blade Runner and explore its themes further, it also went on to inspire the Matrix trilogy in turn. Beyond sharing a moody cinematic style, all three films are largely concerned with implications robots raise about the nature of consciousness. However, while Ghost in the Shell holds a certain place in the international dialogue of sci-fi, it perhaps holds a different one in the tradition of anime, where robots' position is still fundamental, but arguably distinct from other sci-fi traditions. Why is that? Because the first popular anime series was Astro Boy, another artificial ass-kicker. Superman's prominence at the dawn of comics in the 1930s set the tone for the whole superhero genre, and those titles' dominance of the U.S. market has, in turn, shaped the comics medium entirely. Likewise, the fact that anime, and the manga that often inspire it, is so often synonymous with a giant robot today hardly seems unrelated to the nature of its first star. Osamu Tezuka's Mighty Adam, known here as Astro Boy, debuted on TV in 1963 and took a fairy tale angle on robots. The hero, Adam, is created as a surrogate son to replace a scientist's dead child, but soon rejected by his creator because he can't pass for human. If the similarities to Pinocchio, especially the Disney version, aren't overt enough, Adam is also sold to a circus where he's made to star in demeaning spectacles. In the long view, though, Ghost in the Shell isn't that much less fantastical. Two decades on, and its cyborgs are still so far off from practical tech, they might as well be made of enchanted wood. Their appeal doesn't hinge on scientific feasibility, though, so much as their utility as metaphors. In Astro Boy, as in the original Pinocchio novel, artificiality is code for unrefined behavior. If this mighty Adam just learns how to behave, either to follow rules or be more in touch with his emotions, then he can become a real boy. The metaphor of robots can evolve to reflect other ideas in even the same series, though. Eight years after Ghost in the Shell's release, artist Naoki Urasawa retold and expanded the classic Astro Boy story arc, The Greatest Robot on Earth, with the manga Pluto. Similar to how modern comics creators like Alan Moore have reinterpreted old, fanciful Superman plots with more mature concerns, Urasawa updates this 50-year-old story arc into something more somber, modeling its fictitious 39th Central Asian War after the Iraq War, for example. Though he still looks like a boy, Adam is a combat veteran, joining an investigation after seven of the most powerful robots who fought in that war, and who are equated to walking weapons of mass destruction, are seemingly targeted for revenge murders. Their workings are still treated fancifully. Robots can have wives and kids, and their designs often defy practical engineering. However, the absurdity of their appearances actually factors into the symbolism. These robots are soldiers often built for war, not just trained for it. 
Them simply not being made for peacetime is stressed by how out of place they look on the home front. Perhaps the most striking example is North No. 2, a war machine who opts to become a lowly butler and learn the piano after the war. He tries to pass for something other than what he was created to be, but a black cape only just barely hides his threatening, insectile arms. These robots grapple with existentialism just as Major Kusanagi does, but their identity crisis doesn't concern the nature of their mind so much as their place in a world they weren't made for. Another storied robot franchise is Tatsunoku's Neo-Human Prince Kashurn, which debuted in 1973 and has the white disco arrow jumpsuit to prove it. Like Astro Boy, iterations of the franchise have reinterpreted the title character over the years. A live-action movie is often intended as an update of Hamlet with robots, which speaks to the timelessness of its hero's angst. The 2009 anime revival Kashurn Sins, though, takes place long after robots have taken over Earth and actually starts with the planet's fate sealed. The hero Kashurn is reimagined as an assassin who murdered a machine messiah. He has fuzzy memories about why he did it and tries to make right, even after her death begets The Ruin, a prolonged doomsday cursing all robots to rust. Once more, Sins doesn't bother with realism. Its robots cry, bleed, and even wheeze while exerted. Desperate, superstitious packs of them even think that eating Kashurn will cure them. Unlike with humans, there's no speculating at the meaning of these robots' creations. Their fate is in their design. Their job is their purpose for existence. So, from frame one, Sins ponders the dilemma of beings whose destinies have either been fulfilled or invalidated. What is a savior to do when there's nothing left to save? Kashurn remains a supreme warrior, but the series stresses the futility of every spectacular battle he dominates and the grudges his rivals hold on to. The ruin has rendered it all moot. The philosophies at play are fatalism and determinism, which go back even farther than dualism to ancient Greece and India. For those keeping track, they were also riffed on in the Matrix trilogy. Basically, fatalism holds that all beings are beholden to a destiny no actions can alter. Kashurn remembers the murder of Luna gradually as the series progresses, so it's presented as a fate he's striving to evade, but can't. No matter the regret he feels, this sin is what he was made for. Determinism is a similar doctrine. It holds that all events, including moral choices, have been set by big, largely unknowable actions that happened long ago. In this series, that's Luna's murder, the cause damning even the mightiest. Just as individual robots can't defy the molds they were set in, the world itself can't defy the fate Kashurn has programmed for it. Notice the wordplay there? Unlike with humans, there's no speculating at the meaning of these robots' creation. So, even a kid in swim trunks who fires machine guns out of his butt what? can still offer heady science fiction themes to meditate upon. Whether they aim for cutting-edge realism like Ghost in the Shell or go full tilt into fantasy like Kashurn, robots in anime can raise provocative and widely varying existentialist questions. And as our points of contrast have shown, these characters weren't built off the same mold. Though often made of hard steel, they're quite flexible as metaphors, and their symbolism can truly be in the eye of the beholder. So, what do you guys think of giant robots in philosophy? Let us know in the comments. Like, share, comment, subscribe, do all the things. This is Gamma Ray. See you next week.